Hi, my name is Fritz Jukage. This is my colleague Greg Manthe. We are both certified occupational hygienists employed as mining inspectors for Resource Safety and Health Queensland. Today we're going to give you an overview of a recent project we undertook focusing on polymeric chemicals. These substances are used extensively in the coal mining industry for a range of strata consolidation, cavity filling and sealing applications. This work focuses on the isocyanate based resins, polyurethane and urea silicates. Before proceeding further, it's important that we acknowledge the assistance and support that we were provided by the three suppliers of these products to the Queensland coal industry. Their assistance involved not only full access to their product information, but also technical support and operators to help us undertake the testing. It's important that when we look at the results for this testing, that we apply some caution in the context for which it was undertaken. These results do not mean to replicate in any way, shape or form, personal exposure that would be encountered by coal mine workers in the underground coal environment. The testing we undertook was specifically designed to confirm the presence of certain substances, not the actual exposure risk in the working environment. By that I mean the testing we undertook was worst case scenario. We looked at low ventilation environments where we allowed substances to reach vapour saturation in an enclosed environment. Similarly with our spill simulation, this test was undertaken by entrapping a, a large volume of solution in an enclosed environment. This would not replicate what would be found underground where a substance would be allowed to run away or be absorbed into the coal surface. We placed our monitors directly behind this substance and blew a quantity of ventilation over it for a, for a given period. Again, just like to emphasise that the results that we present are not meant to represent underground working environments and our testing was specifically designed to understand and confirm the confirmation of certain contaminant isocyanates. So why are we doing this testing? Back in 2017, the committee responsible for drafting recognised standard 16 commissioned some independent testing to establish airborne exposure risk when using these products in the underground environment. This testing was specifically measuring isocyanate exposure from MDI or methylene diphenyl diisocyanate. This is the only isocyanate that is meant to be present in these substances. Now this testing found had a unique finding. They actually found other organoisocyanates present in air. Some of these other isocyanates are much more volatile than the relatively stable MDI. But again, caution needs to be provided because this testing was only undertaken on one substance provided by one supplier and a relatively small sample number. However, it was very uh, important that we establish whether this was a result of laboratory error, a batch issue, or perhaps just related to a single product. So in 2020, RSH commissioned a project to back up the initial preliminary testing. The subsequent testing and the results which Greg will talk to you about shortly looks at products provided by all three suppliers. It looks across a range of seven isocyanate based formulations and it looks at various scenarios, spill test, headspace, mixing and curing. We also importantly looked at three different sampling methods to establish which method was the most accurate and the most suitable for the underground coal mining environment. And while we were undertaking this testing, there was also a very good opportunity to look at some other contaminants that may be produced during the use of these products. Specifically, I'm talking about the presence of volatile organic compounds or VOCs. So some sampling was done during the mixing and curing to look at these substances. Thanks Ritz. So when we're measuring for atmospheric isocyanates, we'd normally only expect to find the target MDI group. The issue of concern with this testing that we've done in the follow-up confirmation testing in 2020 was that we've found two particular organoisocyanate contaminants, methyl isocyanate 
and phenylisocyanate. And the key issue of concern here is that both of these molecules contain the um, reactive NCO or cyanate group. The proportion of the contaminant in the atmosphere is affected then by the volatility of the, of the particular um, cyanate chemical, uh, the heat of the reaction, the proportion of the contaminant in the liquid, and the byproducts from the reacting chemical. I'll just talk about the results that uh, we found in the testing. And the first batch of tests was neat emission testing from the headspace above MDI liquid, the isocyanate or MDI um, concentrate. What we found in all urea silicate and polyurethane formulations was phenyl isocyanate and methyl isocyanate, often at concentrations greater than the MDI concentration in the atmosphere. Um, we also found uh, MDI prepolymers and oligomers, so short chain MDI molecules. And we found that the asset samplers, one of the three types of sampling media that we used, were more reliable and sensitive than the other two. From the mixing and curing tests, uh, which covered both urea silicates and polyurethane formulations, we again found the two contaminants of concern in every formulation, every mixing formulation across all three suppliers. Again, the concentrations were generally greater for the contaminants in the atmosphere than for the MDI in the atmosphere, which uh, was unexpected. Um, and again, prepolymers and oligomers and the asset samplers stood up better than the other two sampling media. Uh, one of the issues we found with the mixing and curing was because of the heat generated and the moisture content in the urea silicates in particular, that there was impact, adverse impact on the sampling media from atmospheric uh, water molecules. With the emission uh, tests from the spill simulation, uh, we found phenyl isocyanate in all three tests, as, as well as MDI monomers, polymers and oligomers. The asset samplers again stood up best across those testings. What we did find was that the uh, concentrations of contaminants from the spill test were uh, notably low. The testing was conducted um, at about a foot distance downwind from the liquid surface and the results that we um, measured from those tests suggest that the current exposure um, exclusion zones are possibly um, too great and could be reduced. This is a summary slide that shows the um, seven different, um, sorry, eight different formulations that we tested uh, from the three suppliers. And the key point of concern or interest here is that phenyl isocyanate and methyl isocyanate were detected across all substances tested, whether they be neat um, MDI liquids or mixing and curing across all formulations of polyurethane and urea silicates. We also found, uh, as Fritz mentioned earlier on, um, we did some uh, speciation testing for volatile organic compounds using a, a fairly precise and sensitive environmental method uh, using sumo canisters. And what we found was in all of the mixing and curing tests, um, we found or detected at least a dozen um, different volatile organics of different types in all tests. Whilst these were at low um, concentrations, the issue is that the contaminants are there, they're potentially unexpected or unanticipated, and the hygienist should at least be aware of the presence and the potential additive effect or combined effect of these different chemicals, even at low levels. Some of the types of chemicals that we detected were halogenated, there were ketones, alcohols, dioxane, and a range of other uh, volatile organics. Uh, some of concern at levels uh, that were concerning and uh, some not. Um, unfortunately, there was no single volatile organic identified that could act as a surrogate for measurement or broad measurement of, uh, of the different processes um, in order to quantitate 
risk. Um, so they'll, we'll probably look at uh, doing more testing there. One of the uh, key considerations is ventilation underground. And in terms of the volatile organics, it's uh, likely that current underground ventilation rates would provide adequate dilution of these chemicals from mixing and curing. When an occupational hygienist uh, undertakes measurement, um, there are three key processes uh, that, um, that they would follow. The first one would be to identify the chemical of concern. Normally they'd look at a safety data sheet or a label and identify the chemical that they were looking to measure, uh, in this case, MDI. The hygienist would then research a method um, and uh, an exposure um, uh, uh, sampling method to collect a sample that could then be sent to a laboratory. And that could mean an internet search um, going through uh, reference material such as uh, regulatory bodies, OSHA and NIOSH and um, ACGIH, and then identify a laboratory to send the samples to. In terms of these contaminant isocyanates that we found, each of those stages is compromised um, by one or more factors. In the case of the identification, um, these are three uh, sections, excerpts from section three of safety data sheets from the chemicals, some of the chemicals that we tested. And you'll note that on each of those SDS, there's an ingredient number with matching chemical abstract system number or CAS numbers. But each of those three chemicals have different names and only one ingredient on any of the safety those three safety data sheets lists the common name for MDI. So immediately, unless your, ISIS, uh, your occupational hygienist is familiar with the complex chemistry involved in this, uh, with this subject, um, they may be at a disadvantage in terms of identifying uh, what substance they're actually looking to measure and whether it's in the chemical that, they're, that the supplier is using. With regards to the chemistry, um, uh, the MDI itself has three different isomers or three different variants of the same chemical. One is more common than the others, but then you add on oligomers and prepolymers, trimers, tetramers, and unless the hygienist is uh, familiar with what they're looking for and the method targets those particular chemicals, the end result, the, the measured concentration will be inaccurate and potentially understate the risk. Critically, in terms of the air monitoring and the biological monitoring, those processes specifically target the parent isocyanate molecule or a derivative of that molecule, amine derivative for the air monitoring and a biological intermediate for the urine sampling. In terms of the monitoring methods, most um, current methods use either a treated filter or impinger. And the impinger and treated filter method is generally seen as the gold class because it um, historically has captured or believed to, be, to have captured the, the greatest, uh, greater accurate concentration of the chemicals that we're looking for. But impingers are fragile, contain a flammable liquid, obviously can't be used in underground coal. And the treated filter methods don't look for these contaminant isocyanates, methyl or phenyl isocyanate. The asset sampler we found has greater variability and will look for um, the different species. The report from the laboratory will speciate the different isocyanates and the concentrations. And it will also look for uh, the prepolymers and um, oligomers of MDI, which was uh, quite handy during this process. In terms of the analytical process, some of the problems include uh, whether or not the laboratory has the equipment that can identify the isocyanate contaminant uh, molecules, um, whether the method is NADA accredited, uh, and in some cases uh, a NADA accredited laboratory will do the analysis and that particular method isn't accredited, but it's still being done by an accredited laboratory. So there's confidence there that the laboratory has the right processes and systems in place. In terms of uh, 
not an accredited laboratories for isocyanate. It's the only two that uh, we found in Australia um, that do isocyanates do the treated filter method. And so there's a disadvantage there in terms of identifying these contaminant isocyanates. I'll pass back to uh, Fritz and uh, he'll talk through the conclusions and the next stages of this process. Thanks. So now just to step through the conclusions of our study, what we were able to demonstrate is that MDI contains contaminant isocyanates. Some of these are much more volatile than MDI itself. To put that in perspective, some of these are over 100,000 times more volatile in terms of vapour pressure. So this represents an issue because currently these are not identified on the SDSs and they are not identified on the product information available to hygienists and coal mine workers. We are still convinced that the primary route of exposure is via skin absorption. But the issue here is, is that the, uh, the biological sampling that is currently undertaken does not actively seek to identify these organoisocyanate contaminants such as methyl and phenyl isocyanate. So together with the air monitoring which is currently undertaken by the preferred method, this again does not look for or are capable of measuring phenyl and methyl isocyanate. And what this equates to is that exposure risk to coal mine workers is potentially underestimated. It's very important that we work through these issues so that we can get a good estimate of personal exposure. Our testing did reveal that based on worst case scenario, current exposure risk from a spill underground is likely to be quite low. This is an important finding because it is one thing that has been debated significantly in the Recognised Standard Committee. We also established that there are VOCs emitted during mixing and curing of these substances. But again, based on current ventilation requirements where these products are used, the exposure risk seems to be relatively well controlled. But it's important that further testing in this area takes place so that we can confirm these findings um, to a high degree of confidence. So the key issues really for the coal industry at present are the chemical characterisation and the SDS. It is important that these are clearly identified so that hygienists uh, and safety professionals on mine sites understand that these products may be present and are aware of the monitoring and biological monitoring required to measure them. It's also important that we now look at the exclusion zones um, that are currently existed in Recognised Standard 16 and, and use the information that we've gathered to reevaluate these so that they are both workable but most importantly protective of coal mine workers. And it's important, as I mentioned, that further testing is undertaken with respect to VOCs during the curing so that we can um, better understand the exposure risk to coal mine workers. So what's next and where do we go to from here? Communicating our findings with stakeholders is key. We've already undertaken rigorous um, communication with the suppliers of these products who have been very, very supportive of the process and are also very keen to work forward to a solution. It's important that we establish methods for biological testing for phenyl isocyanate in particular. And it's very encouraging to see that Test Safe Australia have already well advanced into um, proofing and establishing a method that can be used to measure this substance in urine. So this is in its advanced stages and is a, real, a really good step forward. It's also important that we work with laboratories to, um, to improve analysis methods. As Greg mentioned earlier, there's really only one methodology that's currently available that, can, that is sensitive enough and can be used um, to measure these contaminants um, and with a degree of confidence and down to a, a concentration uh, where they may be present. We're also looking to develop a test method to detect contaminants in bulk liquid formulations. Um, this is important, we feel that, um, so that when a, a new product is brought onto the market, that we can um, determine if these contaminants are present and this can be made available, this information to those hygienists and, and coal mine workers 
for risk assessment and risk management processes. It's also important that we take these findings and upload them into recognised standard 16. This is in summary the contaminants that may be present, the shortcomings of the air monitoring and the current biological monitoring techniques and the review of exclusion zones and the health surveillance requirements. So with an eye to the future, it's important to acknowledge that Safe Work Australia are currently reviewing all their exposure standards. Our testing and findings are based on current exposure standards. And like many of these exposure standards Safe Work are reviewing, significant reductions are proposed for the isocyanotes. So this just needs to be brought in mind. Thank you very much for your time and attention. If you have any questions or wish to contact either of us, our contact details are shown on the screen. Thank you.